since my last week on the house our last paper, I've stayed on task to get support, to get new mental health for children and to have trauma counselors in all schools starting at the elementary school level. And from what I'm hearing and being told, there are efforts being made by our school board, city, and county council to move in that direction. Am I correct? <laughs> I am looking forward to getting an update soon about the Opioid Settlement Fund District. This, this should be. Tonight I am here to talk about the second annual Beach Mental Health Rally I have scheduled on April 28, 2024 from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Gazebo downtown Franklin. We are going to have many new speakers at the event with our keynote speaker being our very own North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Secretary, Toby Kennedy. Our focus this year is mental health and coping skills, including activities for the kids. I would like to put up signs around the park and street, streets to advertise my event like our politicians do. Do I need special permission for that? I would like for you all to come and support the event, as most of you did last year. Our organization, YS Kids, and myself published a book last year called Shattered, Lives Broken by Substance Abuse and How We Put the Pieces Back Together. And it includes my story. The book is available on Amazon, and all proceeds go to YS Kids. Tonight, I will be... I would like to present a signed copy to you, County Commissioner, so we can be can, can become a part of a town council. Hi, John. Uh, Chatter. Uh, Glad to see you're healthy. Uh, anything anybody want, you want to add to this? Yep. Yeah. Oh, what we got to be healthy and what? Chatter is a book uh, of life's broken because of substance abuse and how uh, they put the pieces back together. There's about 20 stories in there from all different walks of life. Some people from recovery, some people who have lost loved ones, and Grace's story, of course, of her work is up there. And uh, all of them have uh, their own <coughs> stories, so it can be published by Rice Kids. I want to thank all of you, as well as our school board members and city council for their continued support and for listening, and I hope to continue to work together with you for the future of us children in our community and state. You know I'm not going to go away, right? <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, I want to thank our law enforcement agencies, including Sheriff Colbert and City Chief of Police, Colin. For the quick response during the very scary time for us children several weeks ago when we got locked down at Seeing the quick response plan is worth it. Thank you. Okay, one other thing. Good. What least award do you want? Um, so recently I have award, I have one the award of the East East Citizenship Award here in Lake County for the Chamber of Commerce from 2023 to 2024. Okay. Right. Um, is there any questions? Um, hoping something may pop up. I know you email, and I know why I was kids, and I know you're going to and they communicate with us. Thank you very much. Great job, man. Thank you, Grace and Grace. Ben, can you use this microphone and make sure your speech is clean? Yes, sir. All right. It's this TV voice. I hardly need a microphone. Bring it on. Very unusual. I was looking at our agenda and the new business, G. This is being considered. And I appreciate that you all have put this back on consideration. And I just, I know y'all know this, but I just want to remind you that a quarter of a cent is just a quarter. Put this in four pieces right here. And that's all that's being asked for is one, qu one little quarter of this penny. And it would take us five dollars 
to get one penny more on our bill when we go to Walmart or any place else. So thank y'all so much for putting it back up, and I hope that we can get a chance to vote on it again. And all of you will be in support of it. Thank you for your support the last time. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I am here for two things. One, to reiterate what Marianne said. A hundred percent. In fact, I will help politics for you if you pass the referendum <laughs> on the quarter cent tax. You tell me where you want that message out, and I will help you. I will work hard to make that happen so that we can get people who travel through here to also put money in Mason County, like it should have happened two years ago. The other thing I want to um, stress is how important this little sea of green behind me is, not just because St. Patrick's Day is coming up, but all these people in green shirts back here, they have a very important message for you, and I want to hope that you support them in what they're doing for this community. That's it. Sure, this is Scott Bates. The handsome one. <laughs> 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 oh, I guess five minutes. <laughs> Thank you for considering the core and sales tax. Please, 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 let's get this through this time. <laughs> The reason I came here tonight is about the roads in Macon County. And I talked to Josh about the Georgia Road. And it seems like it's not going to continue this year. So I to bring that up. On behalf of myself, I want to bring up some of the roads, especially these culverts they're putting in, are rough. I need to get them aligned in every few weeks or every couple of months. So if there's something that can be done to improve the roads, that would be I think that's an issue that everybody in this county can agree with. So I want to say thanks for coming in person tonight. Um, let me get your contact information and we'll send a freeway email out to our state rep or our local district rep the DOT. And let's make them All right. Let's tweak the wheel against the grease. You have an email address I don't I can take down real quick. Right. This is Jake Wilden at MSM.com. Remove item 10E, 
Mm -hmm. We're going to, uh, that would be another item we'll add to that. March 25th meeting, we have uh, completed the contract. We do have a contract uh, that we think is going to work. We're just ironing out uh, some minor details right now that are inconsequential. Um, the CM at risk work, the Highlands project is currently uh, working and we're not holding them up. We're not waiting until the 25th uh, to ink this. So that's not going to delay anything. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll need to remove item 10E. And we need, we need to add one appointment to the NBC under, that's 13A. So instead of two seats, we need to, we're going to be discussing adding uh, or filling three seats on that economic up for tonight. <coughs> We have the contract ready. We're just ironing out a, a couple of minor details. Um, and we were back and forth this afternoon. And I spoke with the contractor. We're going to postpone that until the 25th. It's not going to hold the project up. They're working on it. Um, but to eat that document, we're actually going to do it on the 25th. We've got a few little things that, that we're doing. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right. Mr. Chairman, uh, under new business 11J, discussion regarding draft registration for and haulers and collectors in Lake County, Solid Waste. Um, this is the first that, um, that I've heard anything about this process and, uh, and I would like to table that uh, until a future meeting to get a clear understanding of what has uh, promoted this uh, for the Lake County landfill and the uh, call of the uh, And I think the intent of tonight is to present it to the board for the first time. Um, this is something that the solid waste is presenting tonight, or would be presenting tonight for the first time for informational purposes for the board only. It is intended to start that discussion process and to better inform uh, the board on what the, the solid waste department is thinking with this proposal. Um, so that's what it was purely meant tonight for informational purposes only and to uh, begin the discussion for this board. So, I don't know if that impacts. But that, that's fine. Uh, no, no, no action. There's, no action. There's just a lot of information provided to us with fee schedules and everything else. So, uh, that's fine. Then you don't know if we're going to do that. 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 We're going to do Get all that change done. Then we go to the reports of registration, and I'm going to take over the piece of paper. Oh, put the piece of paper. Franklin Garden Club. Okay, there you go. All the green shirts here. That, that's the thing. Okay. I run the town. I'm uh, just going to do the name between Franklin Garden Club and the town and the town. 
park benches. They're $1,600. You can't afford to replace those. Those, the little ones that are metal ends with like plastic or fiberglass boards were really, really tricky. So uh, that was one of Men's Challenge Project was to go through and tighten all the screws, replace bolts that were missing. Some of them, it was shocking how many bolts were missing and that no one had fallen yet. Um, but they're yellow, the slats are yellow, and they're really awful looking. So um, one of our projects this year, we've already talked with Job Corps about, is we'll provide the paint and they're going to come in and paint them all black. So at least we can extend their life a few years. So that's one of the ways we're trying to stretch our dollars as much as possible is to come up with solutions to extend life of items and do things as reasonably as we can. Um, so now, so um, you have in your packets pictures, they're going to be projected, and then Rhonda's also going to hand you some. Um, when she passes them, they're numbered on the back. The first one you'll see is, um, is pictures number one and two are of the two metal fences or the metal fences around both squares as you can see in the first um, picture they are very rusty um, and then they are also um, very discolored so again that's one that we've already asked job court if they will come and paint them if we provide the paint so that's something that we feel like will um, extend the life of the funds, but also make it look a lot nicer than it currently does. Um, one of our projects this year that's going to be a big community event, because we really want our community to realize these are their gardens. Um, these you know, are the heart of Franklin, but they're also the heart of Macon County, and it's important for our um, they not just to be visitors, but that our community realizes these these gardens are theirs to use. So we are going to be creating a kindness rock garden in Renton Square. And that really came from, um, if any of you follow our Facebook page, we found a painted rock in the garden this past fall. And um, it reminded me of a rock garden in the neighborhood we lived in in South Carolina where there was a corner and there was just a bunch of painted rocks and people, there was a basket of unpainted rocks. People could take a rock, paint it, put it back take a walk that they thought, you know, this is really cool. So that's just something that we thought would be a really fun way to especially get kids involved and using the gardens. And I had actually found after we posted that a, a rock in the clock tower that was clearly painted by a child and left for someone to find. So that was kind of a cool idea. And I think it will take off just having seen a couple of those things happening. And we'll have a big celebration in June for everybody in the community to open that garden, be in the gardens, painting their rocks, and moving them to get it started. Um, we talked already about starting to decorate the gardens year-round. Uh, one of the things that we will be adding is on the pergola, which is always going to be decorated, a Franklin, North Carolina sign, because we want when people take pictures and post them all over social media, as everyone does, we want them to know where they were when they took that picture and hopefully have more people come um, and visit our, our gardens in our town. Um, pictures three and four, um, we have several trees. These are the Hanoki or the false cypress trees that are in Rankin next to the Old Lincoln News Building. They um, are really showing signs of stress on um, the tree and soil testing consulted and worked with the extension um, office to uh, find out if there was diseases. Um, there is not. But they are just stressed. They're too tight in there. They, um, and so we've also talked to, I briefly talked to Josh beforehand uh, to let him know we're working with Bob, who he knows um, from Modern Tree Services. And so he's, he's been advising us. And the, between the co-op and um, and Bob, we really feel like those are trees that are going to probably need to come down. Um, with, when they do, we will already have a plan in place to replace some of those new trees or shrubs that will fill in that area. So that's always going to be our goal is to move towards native whenever possible. Um, so picture number five. This is really hard to tell what you're looking at, but this is where, especially Josh, we invite you to to uh, meet us over there with Bob. We spent a long time, uh, Bob and I did, 
looking at um, how the roots from the big oak tree are pushing up the walkway. This is a really bad picture of the worst of it, but we thought about shaving the root, we thought about severing the root, but then the more we looked at it, that root system goes probably 20 feet out um, between you know, the two directions, and it's like the main path. So if we, if we sever it, we're probably going to lose the tree. So that's something we're going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with, and that's where Josh gave us that also gave us an answer there. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so we are also planning on pressure brushing. Didn't know that was a thing, but um, evidently we can pressure brush the AstroTurf in Rankin Square, and that will help extend the life of that AstroTurf, which is massively expensive to replace. So again, we're trying all we can to, to save money. Um, we'll be replacing uh, mulch, flowers, plants as needed. Um, the big one, though, that we really wanted to talk to you about tonight is the clock tower. Um, and so we would like to repaint the clock tower. We've already talked to John Core. I, in fact, reconfirmed with them today that they are on board to repaint it once um, the repairs are made. And we will be providing John Core any of the supplies they need to do the painting project. So they'll just be doing the labor for free for us. Um, but as you can see, um, the clock tower is in a lot of uh, a need of a lot of repairs, um, including the roof and the fascia boards, which are, are really broadened. Um, so we know that uh, July 11th of 2023, we had some numbers from the Garden Club come and speak to the commissioners um, and and um, bring it to your attention that it was starting to really have some need of repairs. And um, at that point, um, Commissioner Hayden, you had mentioned appointing a point person, so um, I'm not sure if that's been done at this point. Um, so we really would you know, like to, if it hasn't, like to see that happen and figure out you know, how we can make these repairs happen. Um, one of the things that we also did was went and talked to Robert Shook, um, the curator at the uh, Historical Museum just to make sure there were no restrictions and uh, parts of it. It is obviously a replica from the original clock tower, but it does have some original parts as well. Um, and he said there are no restrictions. He did ask that we uh, continue to use the current core bells and offered um, a pattern that they keep in the museum should we need to be building with those. So we know that, that we can move forward with repairs with no restrictions there. Um, as Commissioner Higgins did say last year, um, you know, the clock tower is the center of Lincoln County. It, it is a representative of our county, and, and since 1881, that original clock tower was on top of our courthouse. So uh, it is something that we feel like is really important as the center of our county seat to get it repaired, get it painted, and, and just really have it be the showpiece and symbol that it is of our county. Um, you can see in the last one, we also have a leak. We, we actually had the town of Franklin out there, but two or three weeks ago, trying to figure out where all the water inside was coming from. And because we now have turf on the inside too, around the, the gates. So we knew it wasn't coming through the side. It's clearly coming through the roof. Um, we happened to be in there um, after a heavy rain. And I'm like, I'm getting drift on. So, um, so the, the roof is in really need of some, some uh, probably just full replacement. Um, so this is obviously an eyesore, unfortunately, but it's also between a safety issue because it, it's getting so many pieces that are rotting that um, we feel like that it won't be too long before we'll start having some of those pieces break off. So the goal of the um, Franklin Garden Club has always been to maintain, but also to continue to improve. And that's a focus that we're really um, looking at with some of these maintenance issues, which we need to make sure that we're maintaining, but always moving forward with new things like the tables and, and benches and stuff. Um, Macon County has uh, included $2,500 in the annual budget every year since 2007. Daily prices have gone up since 2007. Um, we've had a lot more maintenance issues, and as you've seen, we've spent more than 13000 just this year. 
So um, we have come to, to respectfully ask that the um, county commissioners approve 5000 this year in the budget to help kind of make sure that we can make these improvements and continue uh, to keep it at both of those gardens um, next to, to go for visitors and our locals. Thank you. I will say, um, I've gone by there often. The kitchen lady do such a good job with the gardens. I didn't realize how terrible some of these pictures are. Yeah. 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 Well, when Bob was up in his bucket truck, I mean, the oak tree, he went, Oh my gosh. I said, I wish I would have remembered to have him take a cell phone from up above because he said they didn't stand the gun at the top. Yeah, yeah, we did notice when we found the leak that that the top there's plexiglass in the place you go. So okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Leaps out the baskets for a couple of years, sure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Appreciate it. Obviously, as a citizen, I can't. When I go down there, I appreciate what y'all do. Right, square and clock tower. <laughs> if we had to pay that out to a private firm or hire people to do it, twenty-five hundred dollars a year. And having worked in my yard then, as we speak, and uh, I wish it was twenty-five hundred. <laughs> It's, it's, it's amazing how expensive it gets, yeah. But the clock tower, I know that it is a lot of money to think about doing, but we're now coming into probably some safety concerns. Yes. And I think that kind of changes it too. Tell me real quickly, uh, what are your sources being so? So we do get um, some money from the town. That goes, they they also help, um, you know, with some of the stuff in the, in the uh, two squares, even though it's not theirs. They want to make sure they stay nice, so we appreciate that. But then we also take care of some other areas for the town as well. Um, and then we have our annual plant sale, which is May 11th. That is our big one <coughs> every year. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so we may be looking at some, um, with, what was that under donations? Donations, yeah, membership dues we pay annually. But we'll also, um, if if our our costs continue to be at this level, we're going to have to be looking at some things. And you just took all the town headquarters down there. Y'all maintain that town. In front of town hall, yes. We don't maintain it. We we plant it and then um, they keep it up. Um, Gio, Gio keeps it up the rest of the summer. Um, but then uh, that that drainage area coming into downtown from um, Islands Road area, that actually we just took that on. It's going to ask us. That doesn't belong to them either. That's the state. But again, we want to see it look nice because it was just looking so ratty. So um, we're putting planters down Main Street um, this year. The wood planters is on the um, agenda as well. I know that's not in the squares, but anything that makes that downtown area look good. Um, yeah, the two entrance signs for uh, Welcome to Franklin have been added. I, I, we, we agree to that. So our members as a whole don't know that we're taking on another project. So. <laughs> You're sad. Yeah. You're sad. The street looks good. There's, there's four lots down there in the center of Lake County. Uh, the Z-Bo Right, right. Those are terribly neglected. Uh, we have to have some clones if, if we have to take on <laughs> well, and I appreciate y'all incorporating Team Challenge. That's a brilliant idea. They love it. Mm -hmm. And I've been down there when they were working, and I've watched you ladies. The, the center of the county, and yeah, I was hoping last year that we could come together with a plan for the roots. So even on our side, those roots are looking up the sidewalks mm -hmm. and safety hazards. Right. And some of those trees on this side of the square is going to have to be address mm -hmm. and I hope to have a plan to present to you ladies tonight that had not happened but we need to I appreciate what y'all are doing to those two spots down there we need to expand that to take care of those four corners I mean 
just can't. It frustrates me that we just can't get it together to take care of it. Thank y'all for what you do. And uh, frustrated we talked about this earlier night. You ladies, I watch y'all work down there, sweat, blood, tears. But uh, uh, as far as uh, I mean, twenty-five hundred dollars in the budget, for what you ladies do is, is ridiculous. I, I have no problem making a motion to grant your request for five thousand. But that's still but what you all do. The magnitude of work that y'all do. And you're out having to raise the money to do it to take care of take care of property. What do you guys think? I mean, I think we, I don't have any problem. I think we're in the budget process now. We're all working with. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this settlement. Well, I'll, I'll be submitting our, our proposal to the board. Um, we email, so I'll, yeah. I'll be sending that in. So as part of the upcoming budget request. Yeah. Okay. You spent fourteen thousand dollars just in materials. Right. You're asking for five plus all your labor. What, what can you ask for the donations? Um, we really haven't done a lot of donations. It's mostly been county, town, and then um, we, what was it, 2600 from the plant sale? Does that sound right? Yeah, sure. last year. For last year for the fundraiser, yeah. And then um, right now we have membership of I think we are Florida people are not back yet, so I think we're about 28 right now. Um, and uh, so one of the things we are looking at as another option to raise money is to offer um, membership that would be for people who are not going to be active members, kind of like a, a support membership, if you will. So I kind of like the Greenway guys, you know, they have, that's where I got my idea, they have a lot of members that I know aren't all down there necessarily working, but that money is helping them. So we're we're looking at ideas also to bring in some additional funds. And your membership will be up to you. Currently 20, it's going to probably have to go up a little bit because that's been 20 for a long time too. But we'll try to keep that season like that. They get a they get a shirt, and I just found out our shirts are sixteen dollars. So. <laughs> that's not really fun, but that's not good. I told year two of membership. So. You're charging for the membership to take care of the county problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My question about the clock tower is: uh, How did that rotten clock tower become your issue taking care of the garden? I mean, it's in the middle of the I mean, how, I mean, but that is that not out of your scope of what? Uh, well, we don't. Yeah. We we can't repair it. No. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. That's what I. That's the point that I'm trying to make. That clock tower, uh, with the roof leak and everything else, and the trim pieces of the facial board, um, it's on rock to the ground. Yes. Right. This is not yeah. something that we can play around with. You either fix the clock tower, not you personally, right, right. or we lose it. Right. And Commissioner Hickton and I walked through the whole place and we've identified all the issues. Um, and the recommendation was, for well, the Job Corps came on board, the question is, is why aren't we incorporating the high school carpenter class to help make these repairs and uh, as someone that basically grown up in Highland we see a need the community comes together well we are a county of building contractors why we can go outside of the tax base and get volunteers like you ladies take an absolutely beautiful job of you there's no question the job that y'all do. But just like Commissioner Deacon has said, look across the street at what we're facing. A life expectancy of streetscape. All these trees and these planters have, they've outlived mm -hmm. their life expectancy. If you go down all the sidewalks, the picture you can show of the, um, the brick papers that where they're cracking because of the root structure, that's happening all over this country. But we are better than this. To stop 
allowing our county to fall apart. And how do we get there? But I, I think, you know, we have people that building contractors, we have people that are financially secure, we have people that are not financially secure. So how do we, as a county, get people to volunteer to take care of some of these issues without depending on tax collection to do this work? Just like your volunteerism, you show exactly how many hours that you volunteered, the work that you did, what it saved the taxpayers that make them down. Beautiful job. How do we address and get the rest of it through? And for God's sake, let's get this clock tower rebuilt by someone in this. Uh, I mean, if we have a maintenance department, the maintenance department is, are uh, they not capable of? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, you've got to understand, you know, we've got about 400,000 square feet of buildings on hundreds of acres of any each one of those buildings. I mean, you're talking about uh, 70 something HVAC units that have maintenance. I and mean, a building like the town of Franklin, you know, we talked about working with them, and we worked with the town of Franklin, like, for instance, the sewer line that serves LBJ. Um, the town collects revenue on that sewer line, but, you know, every time that sewer line is repaired, we have to go out and repair that sewer line. Sometimes that ties up four or five people for days on that job, so we're used to working with the town on things like that, and it's just a matter of prioritization, and the time for these things to be included is in the budget process, certainly, like Commissioner Shields alluded to, and we had our budget kick off retreat, and I don't recall the clock tower being mentioned. I mean, if the commissioner, um, if this board wants to be included in the budget, we're more than happy to put it in the budget. We'll fix the clock tower um, if that's what the desires of this board is, but it's important, like, during this budget process, and that was the purpose of our budget kickoff, you know, is to set these priorities by this Because, you know, the immediate priority of maintenance, and, you know, and, and this, if this project is identified and, and maintenance wants to do it, and, and the board wants maintenance, maintenance to do it, they can certainly do it. And I'm just saying, with the, the amount of space that they maintain in, in all of the county facilities and in, in vast areas that we do maintain, I have to say to the we need a just any one of them. It just has to be prioritized. So if that's if this is what uh, a priority for the board to be included in the budget, we'll certainly put it in. Commissioner Sarah, can I take you back up to something you said? We have uh, woodworking shops, like you said. We also have roofing companies. We did approve get approval from the <coughs> that roof does not have to be shingled. It could be met. Why couldn't we get a, one of the roofing companies to donate? Get a color green, for example. That's the most common metal roof that there is. I'm sure they could have enough, and I'm gonna have any feet with any feet we're talking about, but they could donate to the children. They could even donate to the labor if they chose to. But you're right, it's not our responsibility, but we're the ones that listen to it and see it. And you know, uh well BJ so they paint everything. So why couldn't we approach the community or not we? Why couldn't you folks approach the community and say, look, we need this done and see what you get with no cost for that. I think it's you plan to see. I think it's happening right now. I see school on the next girl seeing over there. You see it to bring the credits for what we're talking about. We have many people that are here. This is for the headlines and it goes on social media and things like that. I think he's planning to see. I think there's a house that's going to come in here and volunteer. I believe he's already had something interesting. Well, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to do it. Let me say one thing. Two things I want to bring up. And this is off topic. Club dues and membership dues. So if you pay, you pay. We're talking about a lot of stuff right here, but I can't get yeah, it right. I mean, membership news and clubs. So listen, we're, we're going to help you, all right? I see our CTE director right back there. That right there is our school board, and we have a wonderful carpentry department. Listen, there are people that want to help. We just 
Christ like do a better job than they do. Well, we do it down at Church and talks to people down in business. Well, we've got donated wood to build planters all up and down Main Street. It doesn't cost us a penny. But going back, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm pointing fingers at the things that work. If they're not asked to do it, they, know, well, they don't know said, to do it. If, if, if you don't ask a building contractor or a supply company for donations, they have no idea. And, um, and so I just like... Um, I'm very impatient when it comes to stuff like this, and I understand the government process and everything else. But this structure right here didn't get this way over. Okay. So um, I guess as a community uh, effort um, and a board effort, then maybe we should identify these problems and, and introduce them to the general public to make move forward. Well, and I think that's what we our push for really getting the community to understand these are all our gardens is, is a part of that. Um, you know, Beasley was like, yeah, we'll give you the wood, that's fine, in a seconds, and um, this is a really small one, but we, I put out a Facebook request on our, you know, like 100 followers, um, we needed pots to dig up some stuff for the plant sale. I put it out in the afternoon, I said drop off tomorrow afternoon, I had to put the next afternoon, please stop bringing pots, because we had so many people drop off pots. So I think if we really ask and get them to understand, you know, we're doing things to these areas so that they can enjoy them, um, that that people will step up and say, yeah, I want to be part of it. Oh, I was say, I'm going to Get you to stop paying the work for us. And get the community involved. That's crazy. But thank you. Thank you all for what you do. Yeah, just one more thing. Uh, has anyone approached the businesses on Main Street to ask for donations? Yes. So one of the things we're doing is because the planters will sit outside the merchants, um, there are some of those small concrete planters that are currently trip hazards. Um, we have asked them, if, you know, given them the little sheet telling them what we want to do with the planters that will be planted year-round, and asked if they would donate those concrete planters because they own them. Um, maybe not the current merchant, but a merchant in there bought them at one point. And we've had good response so far. Yes, absolutely, take them so we can put them in the plant sale and help you know, offset some of those costs. So we're doing everything we can to try to help um, stretch the dollars. Thank you. I think, I think we'll go through a budget process, meeting the plan to see what we and uh, get a lot of people in here that are purchasing. I think we'll get some things together. I still feel strong about the hot power. When did that be a day? I think that's just 1881 was the original one. And then that one since 1972. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we got Franklin Press person here. Okay, Franklin Press could give free advertisement to some company who wants to redo that clock tower. Well, let's talk to me about that. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to discuss um, contract with the Gill Associates for the planning phase of Phase 1A of the Recreational Master Plan, um, which includes the tennis courts and ball courts, the multi-use um, building, we'll have bathrooms, changing rooms for, for tennis, 
and also a bridge that crosses from one side of the park to the other, um, which will enable buses that come to tennis matches to park on a community building side, which is a whole lot easier access than to go up on the pool for the one. Um, we went through the RFQ process to, uh, to pick McGill and Associates. Um, then we went through a negotiation phase for them. Um, the original contract co cost total was 173200 and we were able to get them down to 163200 Seven. Sorry. Yes, seven. And we did have 200000 in the budget, so there's no appropriation needed to enter into this contract. Uh, we originally just put 200000 but with a lot of course, of course, plans change, things change, you know, y'all have a bigger vision for the park, so we can take, you know, money to enter into this contract out of that lot of money. We're looking for a motion. Motion to approve the government into contract with the deal in the I just want to give a quick update. We had a parks rec liaison meeting today. Thank you for brother for coming down the mountain and attending this meeting as well. That's two trips down the mountain every day. Um, something we've been talking about for a number of years. The pickleball, tennis courts, and uh, the paddle facilities. And uh, this falls right in line for CIP. We both need this item. Mr. Shirley, do you like that? Do I have a motion? No. It, um, no, I think um, it's very exciting for uh, new life at this park. Uh, pickleball players have been very patient, understanding through this process, um, and uh, I'm, I'm excited and ready for uh, a new life to start at this rec park. That was 163.700. At this time, I make a motion to enter into contract with McGill Associates. Any further discussion? No, all in favor of the motion here. I do. Thank you. 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 Time on this, uh, uh, forward, forward, forward. should not take more than 10 minutes. Uh, After down the hall, to your right left. Make a motion, we go into closed session. Pursuant to 143-318.11A3. A few minutes later. And that's why I wouldn't take some from where you're at. But, you know, you know something. It might be the second so that's what we're, I mean, that's the only way
and that will go towards purchase of the bi-directional radio system to be installed at the Macon Middle School main building facility, as well as the Macon Middle School locker room complex. So moved, Chairman. No second. As well as, you know, excuse me, as well as the 69,786 also includes the consolidation of all change orders remaining at the Macon Middle School locker room. And resolution uh, and, and resolution uh, out of the um, out of the uh, while we're in discussion, I feel like we need to get some sort of public on what what we're doing here, maybe with the uh, emergency van, maybe some of this stuff like that. Can just give a brief description? Sure. Uh, with this project we had some things uh, from the get go, such as uh, you know, we had omitted from uh, the what went out on the plans, the, the low voltage wiring that the architect had left out of the plans and the building inspector, uh, or, or excuse me, the contractor, uh, you know, had to have that to move forward. So uh, to get a certificate of occupancy, so at that time we had to uh, issue a change order of $90,000 to install that low voltage wiring because we had to have that. And uh, in doing that, that ate up the majority of our $120,000 around about contingency for this project. I mean, we were pretty much hamstrung right there. Um, and, and so the change orders that approved following that um, were included in that total as well. Um, a lot of those were in, in the normal course of doing business, but we would have come nowhere close to exceeding our contingency had we not had that major uh, omission and error by the architect um, on this project. And so we have worked to resolve uh, that issue and consolidate at the same time. Um, the project had gotten behind. There were some liquidated damages that had approved. Um, we were able to resolve those uh, with the building contractor and uh, we were able to reach an agreement with the building contractor and the architect, which uh, we basically negotiated all that down into that $69,786 uh, we'll reference the total cost of the uh, installation of the bi-directional radio system, uh, which also, again, was, uh, was not told to us at the beginning of this project. Uh, again, uh, building contractor and architect goes back and forth, so to settle this in board litigation, we ended on the $61,786 number for everything. Um, just to give you some idea, the installation for the bi-directional radio system would have been $87,000 uh, for the middle school uh, as well as the locker room project. But again, we were able to, to package this deal together and get all that into that $69,786. So again, uh, by no fault of, of anyone in Macon County or anybody on our team, um, we just got to a bad hand. It's one of those situations where you're stuck with an amount that if you want to go to litigation, um, you're going to end up spending more and it's going to be a coin finger contest and you're never going to be able to really get to the bottom of it. So we're happy to settle this. Um, you know, any time we exceed, I, I can't think of uh, any times we've exceeded a contingency on a project that we do is something we do take seriously. And on this board, um, as Commissioner Young alluded to, expects uh, full explanation. So again, uh, by no fault of our own, uh, we're, we're still thankful to get this resolved and thankful to turn over a first class uh, locker room facility there to those children that have made the most of it. It's been a long time for me to feel good to do it. Again, the motion would be to, uh, to appropriate $69,786 for the fund balance. Uh, it has the accompanying budget in it, and that would be for the installation of the bi directional radio system at the Macon Middle School main building, as well as the Macon Middle School locker room complex, and additionally to consolidate all the remaining changes on the Macon Middle School project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. 
Curtis. I'm doing very well, Mr. Chairman. How are you? I do have Curtis with. I need Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, all and I had a discussion, and, and also Mr. Shields uh, last week about bringing the three dash ones uh, for the funding that y'all approved. Thank you again uh, on the previous meeting for the moving the project forward of the Fire Rescue Training Center, and then also for the growth center expansion. I, I believe those two dash ones. That's our terminology in education, which is our construction project numbers. Uh, we call them 3-1s, and that's it. When we approve the allocations of the funds, we put them on the 3-1 and send them down the state. And then the state uh, will approve them. Gives me great pleasure to let you know, because we were trying to fast track this, that we did that last week after the meeting for the approval of the funding. We fast tracked those down, and those were approved. Three dash ones were approved to the state for the system of the last Friday uh, because that just uh, incorporated some additional county funds in the adjusting of the state budget funds from that, uh, from that standpoint. They were able to uh, check that box and approve, which gives us the opportunity to move forward to those projects. So we should be moving those out to the goods that we're doing next, hopefully, um, 30 days out of the week. Putting those hard pieces together and going out to the that's where we're at with those. I just want to ask if there's anything else you want. Uh, no, I think that doesn't it. take a, a vote on that. No, 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 I think the board needs to the board needs to formally approve uh, each of them. And I think you know just to, to draw note, of course, it's included in the CIP. Uh, but from the fire rescue training center comes on the additional operational cost of sixty nine nine ninety one that will be tied to that facility that will be an ongoing cost. Uh, but again, the Hickman Capital Facility paid up for us this will not come into the budget uh, until that facility is, has been constructed and is online and it's something that has been in the CIP and that we plan to work. Just want to bring it back to your attention. But I, I think it would, uh, if these have already been approved at, at the state level. Yes. Yeah. Because they were amendments to the original board. I just think we should have, just to be clean, I think we should approve the amendment to that. Just for our record. Uh, yes, yeah. Just uh, the first one would be for the fire safety training facility, uh, for the fire rescue training center. We need a, a motion and a approval. And again, we already did this last meeting. We've already approved the funds. This is just for now. Yeah. Uh, no, I make a motion that we approve the. Uh, ratification of revised 3 1 capital improvement project for the Is it later on? Is it Hey, let me ask while we're talking about this. Um, what, what's the fee schedule associated with the fire training plan? Let's just say Otto wants to come use it. Do they pay to use them? Yeah. No. There's not. And what educational facility do other counties? They even come over here. That's more or less thing about the state. And then the junior firefighters through the high school will have the collaboration, they'll be able to come and use that all the time. It's a little bit different than the basic school education one of all the things. We we uh get them to uh education. The, if I may, the state legislature being all public safety personnel of the commission. And it's an investment in public safety for the state of North Carolina. Therefore, if, if we go over to ADT, we have that same luxury of being a key example of that college as well, or anywhere across the state. So, Dow has a large uh, weekend fire school. But they do every spring, I think from March, to three day event. They have hundreds of firefighters from all over the state. And they're all PHM. Um, 
gain over a weekend's time when we're doing it for that. And while we have some, it's in our service area that come to that. We, the Cherokee uh, uh, tribal comes over, you know, Swain comes over to the different facility training. We try to do as much as we can in the county that they are because it's hard for them to come over for some things just because they're out of their district. And like going to now, hey, it would be very tough for them to come over in their district. The same thing as going to cash or things of that nature. So we try to do as much as we can locally for them instead of having them, the facility is available for them. And they get that luxury of including it on their ISO rating and on their uh, doing their inspections too. But no, that's good. I mean, I'll go off topic here, but it's okay. What about the indoor firing range there? People associated with that? What we use as an educational uh, facility. Because you have the liability and the use of the program, so it'll be strictly used for the So I'm sure if you look at any time you want to do one of our schools, yes. or whatever it is. I think that's your first thing that we do is we're going to go through it. I'm sorry, I'm going to go off. Let's get it all out. <laughs> yeah. And then those fees associated with the maintenance, can we share those fees between the two buildings? Are they independent? You know, are they line items that you guys need per building? Or is that something but the, the, it's all the operational things that uh, you use to include in the additional square footage that you're picking up. So if you have a gallon of whatever over here, you add another 3,000 square feet over here, and then you two gallons. So you're saying it's a product that's only about four square foot yes. that we have to have. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all part of the operational uh, standpoint. And that's where you'll see the additional either a full-time employee to help with that additional maintenance to cover that square footage, or a couple of part-time employees to be able to, to work that a lot of Is somebody staffing these buildings at all time, or just book them and use them as needed? We would have someone there for oversight for any of So the current, any time someone's going to use the, the current building, the training ground, we would have someone who may succeed that would be there present. I guess that's the direction of my question is if we have somebody that comes in here from just say Oklahoma or Cherokee and they don't leave in the condition that you know ultimately it's ours. It's our maintenance cost. I just want to make sure that we you know, have the buck stops here, yeah. so the same with the end of the Yeah, we we visited um AB Tech Tender Rain, which is very similar to the end of range and construction. And they have someone that that is their job is to schedule them. For that, and they they have very strict rules and regulations for who the instructors because being a fire instructor is a special key in and of itself. So anyone just can't go in there and utilize the range unless they have that special. The same thing with the private training school. We don't expect someone to go up there and use the track without that. Uh, Curtis, um, I don't know if it's ever been a, um, brought forward. In but how many courses are there uh, to be a level one certified firefighter? Well, right now, the school, we've got three blocks. It's going to take about a year of, of that, too. And, and total hours, somewhere is it? Uh, 400 and something, 470, I think. Yeah, more for that. So through this training facility, um, there are many um, certification uh, abilities at that uh, facility. Ladders, uh, uh, ventilation, I mean, from uh, air packs to, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Well, short of uh, actually having a full-blown fire academy, uh, this is an absolutely wonderful training facility for, uh, and ultimately we save money by not sending these guys at AB Tech. I've met, I've spent many, many trips going across the mountain for these schools. And, uh, and so this, we can keep our our men and women uh, right here in Lake County. And that was part of the investment uh, of the fire apparatus that we have now to allow the departments to come in and not pay apparatus out of the addiction to the apparatus that we have to come in. We're not having to move. 
and the Eskimo Crossers, but that's what's going to save us. Men and women not have to cross the mountain and pull out of our service area with our trucks, and it's going to be here. So yeah. I just hope our sheriff utilizes this. I hope to see you know, a lot of our local resources used. Like, uh, these fire departments. The, the one good thing with the indoor fire and rain is that's the environmental impact that we're listening by putting away the ground. And now the agencies are having to go to the field for it. We're still going to keep that range in operation. There's really need for out here with them too. But it, it gives them an the opportunity to lower down the amount of time and so day qualification at night. We can finish the day with the switch going the night. So we're going to save a lot of training now we're still sitting around waiting on this get low light situation so that we can do night fires. And you know we can get won't hear anything out there and there's an environmental impact that we're going to have that we can in the and all those things too. So, uh, yeah. I no one uh, from the general public is going to be allowed to use this facility, such as concealed carry training. No. Uh, okay. Um, what kind of uh, technology is going to be able to use um, that's, that's a great question. It's a great question. The ballistic uh, protection for the rain and the air handling system are two of the most uh, high cost for the two because based on the size of the rain, we have to move so many cubic feet of air per second to the left out of the air so the, the shooter is not inhaling that and it's not contaminated. So there's a big filtration system with it, so that's a large part of it, the, of that HVAC system that we can regulate the, the heat and air and then keep the air clean as well. And then there's the ballistic part of it which more. We can shoot anything from a handgun up to a rifle uh, and that as well. We have that have ballistic protection on the wall all around so that we're not endangering anybody too. And the athletic structure and the cut back is just another huge expense to uh, be able to get that out of the building and out of the building. And we can actually recycle that way too, which is another way to add that too. When Jackson County is in the money to redo the fire and the building, it's a huge expense for us to get the lead out there. <clears throat> and a lot of times the companies who reuse the lead will come in and they'll pay back to it because we're in that good red place. There's no money to be made and there's nothing. So we actually had to take the burn and wrap it up like a burrito <coughs> inside and use it as a burn to get the protection and keep the range in operation. Now we've got a sand trap over there that we can mine that way in the future. So you know, for future generations, we're going to be close to that too. Well, I'll have to say when I got this agenda and I read that we're going to build a $10 million indoor range, I thought, who in the world has, uh, I mean, I, this is the first, this agenda is the first time that I've heard this. And I said, Mr. Chief, Chairman, what are you doing today? We're going to spend 100 <laughs> A million here, ten million there, but then, of and course, then the researching, the and uh, and then I found out the state was paying for this, uh, and so uh, yeah. we recently had one of our recruits uh, who worked for the sheriff's department to speak uh, in the legislature over the state and she was one of the class arguments that we had. The one thing that, that allows us to do is spend more time doing low light training with the officers, because now if we go over to the range and even make kind of small range over there, we'll do some daytime fire and then we just gotta sit around and wait. And then when we start night firing, we have a cutoff time that we want to stop by 11, but because it's a good neighbor, and then the time that we don't want to. So by 10 o'clock, we're trying to wrap up so that we're out of there and not sure if we the community and stuff like that. So this allows us to keep them in that training environment for much 
longer time, and, and, and they were excited about it. But I, I think the officers who know about it and heard about it, they're excited about it because of the opportunity of low life. Because they're working in those conditions, it may be sunny outside, but they may enter someone's house here in a low life situation and never know what they're going to do. So, you know, the opportunity to you know, be for that. Yeah. All I can say is uh, all of our men and women in uniform, regardless of what level of service that they deserve um, and need the best facilities to protect themselves, our community, and our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
We have volunteers who help us with that. Um, there are four ladies who help us with that every year. And those four ladies counseled over 400, well, counseled 445 folks in 2023. That amounted to about 768 hours that those four ladies contributed to help individuals understand Medicare. That's not including my one paid staff member who helps. That's all volunteer hours with that. Um, when COVID, they were doing a lot of that by phone. We've now got them back in the building and they're doing a lot of their counseling right there in the senior center. Um, our activities volunteers, wow, they stepped it up this year. Our activities volunteers contributed right at 1,500 hours in 2023. They, we had over 14,000 duplicated participants in our different classes in 2023. They lead classes ranging from dance class, to Tai Chi, to arts and crafts. Um, we do have one volunteer, she's pretty um, amazing. She was with us in Franklin several years ago and she led yoga classes for us. Well, she moved off to Arkansas. She was there maybe two months and called us and this was when Zoom was getting started and she said, I miss teaching my class. Can I teach it from Zoom from Arkansas? Sure, we can make that happen. So she's been teaching, she called for probably a good year from Arkansas. Then her husband got a job in Italy. So she moved to Italy. Guess what? She's still teaching a Zoom, a Zoom yoga class for us all the way from Italy. There's about a six hour time difference. So we have our yoga class at 10 in the morning here. It's four in the afternoon there. But she is so committed to teaching those classes. She teaches for us all the way from Italy. She won't make our volunteer banquet, by the way, in, in, in April, but she is just amazing. Um, our home delivered meal volunteers remain strong. Those volunteers um, contributed almost 2,700 hours in 2023. They delivered just over 11,000 hot meals to 70 homebound seniors in Pitt County in both Collins and Franklin. In addition, um, we served about 10,000 hot meals to 266 different congregate participants in our dining room. One of our areas that's really starting to grow is our adult day program with volunteers. Um, when, now that we have reopened back to participants, um, our volunteers, we were kind of slow on letting volunteers come back in there because those folks are usually our most fragile of our older adults that come to the center. So we, we were slow bringing them back, but they have now started coming back. And they are playing music for our folks in adult day. They help them with lunch. They do story times. Sometimes it's just simply spending time with those older adults building puzzles. We have some that love to work on puzzles. Um, and just so you've got some numbers on adult day, in 2023, we had over 2,200 duplicated participants in our adult day program. Our volunteers, um, the range is incredible. We have volunteers aged 24 to 92. You heard me, 92. Um, and that volunteer can run circles around a whole lot of us. Uh, we have several in their early 90s who are delivering meals. Many times the volunteers are delivering meals to folks who are younger than they are. Um, the bulk of our volunteers are in their 70s and 80s out there delivering those meals. Uh, there is not enough I can say about them. They are, um, they are amazing. Their commitment is fabulous. Um, they meet a lot of needs in our community that otherwise would go unmet. Um, my role has been blessed by those volunteers. It's great every every chance I can get out to speak to those volunteers, especially the home delivered meals. It's just I mean, it is just a honor on my part to get to thank them. Um, I would like to ask you folks to adopt a resolution recognizing those volunteers. Um, April 21st through 27th as Macon County Volunteer Week. I think there's already a resolution in your packets. Um, there's also an invitation for each of you in your packet to our volunteer appreciation event that we will be holding on Tuesday, April 23rd at 4 o'clock there at the center. It is an opportunity for us to thank those volunteers for all they do for our older adults in the community. Any questions that you may have about the volunteers? Nope, just want to say thank you to these volunteers. I think it's awesome that you guys have you know, appreciation. That you I was not aware of just how much time these people have gone through. And myself, 
see what you said. She got such an awesome time to see what you did. That's experience on the other week. I had a good time. It was good. So, um, can I make a motion to do this? All right, at this time, gentlemen, I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution and recognition of the <coughs> Crawford Senior Center volunteers. More discussion. Now, the only thing that uh, I have no clue what you what that what happens at the same service center. It's amazing, and those seniors are instead of being before are dear to my heart, and uh, and the work that y'all do with those and and then also, I'm just grateful for uh, all the volunteers and the work that you guys do. So, uh, you know, even the stuff you don't see, they deliver meals yeah. all over this county. And that's okay. all, all over this county. And I think that's probably the highlight of a lot of folks in this county. And a lot of it's not even about the food, it's the interaction. It's the person. As they go all the way from Swain County down to Georgia Road, Alpha Highlands Road, into Highlands Daily, they cover pretty well all of them in county food. Manna Hale is a little challenge because you can't maintain food temps to get to Manna Hale, but we're trying to come up with some solutions. Yeah. Well, but then that doesn't mean our nutrition guidelines for the money we get paid for. So we tried, we thought. <laughs> Our students have named the Pandora Pulse. 
And so the Panther Pulse stands for um, Panther Unified Learning Stage Exchange. And our students and Mr. Pickens' public safety class have designed a logo, which you see on the front of this page, that has like the heartbeat, the pulse, and then a panther head. And they have ordered shirts, and that's on the front of the shirt. And on the side of the shirt, they've also developed a badge that goes on the sleeve. So that's a whole thing in public safety fire fire. You can go to other um, precincts to share the badges around. Badges. The badges. Badges. Yes, the badges. Um, so the Panther Pulse will allow seniors who have um, completed public safety courses the opportunity to intern in various county departments where they will be involved in real world, hands on learning, and still on a sincere um, um, gratitude for civic duty, so a call of duty for civic service. Students will also have the opportunity to job shadow while they're enrolled in the public safety classes where they're learning about the various um, parts of public safety. So this opportunity is only available due to the unwavering commitment of the school board and the Macon County Commissioners in Macon County in creating through ready students. It's because of the collaboration that we have that we can put a program together like this. And as I said many times before, the reason why we can offer 23 and a half days and get over 1,000 credentials is because of the talent of our future. And this program is no exception. Mr. Larry Pickens was willing to earn additional certifications so that we could offer this course. And he also gave up his training period as well. Thanks to the additional funding that you all approved last year to be able to add this additional course. And in collaboration with the school board, we're able to make this happen for our community. So Mr. Pickens is here. He didn't want to come up here. Um, but I'd love to be able to let him have an opportunity to tell you about the qualifications he's to earning. It makes them eligible to be able to come out and do an internship at this meeting in the first place. Um, you want to talk a little bit? No. She said he was going to sing. No, no singing. You can't sing. I do sing, but I shouldn't. Um, so this has been a vision that we had, and I contacted Derek, I contacted Brent, and warned we want to put these kids in an environment where they want to go to work at. We've got one right now that's an internship at the jail every morning from 8 to 10, and then he comes on to school that morning. Uh, they were more than willing to accept these kids in. Uh, Jonathan, I think you said like seven apartments inside the church department that they was willing to put these kids in. And Warren's got that. They're going to work with the fire marshal squad board, just a bunch of different positions, not only. In the fire pipe. We left it at the county level. Hopefully, we can tie the town in a little bit later. We went to McDowell County a couple months ago. They are actually having students do ride along to the city of Iceville on 24 hour shoes in the fire department. So we got to get that excitement. That answer generated somewhere. We think this is the place to do it. We also kicked around that hopefully in a year or two, um, some of the Carpenter students coming in and doing some stuff with maintenance, county maintenance, and that type of stuff. We can get really this working. Well, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, like these kids will leave my place at 1.30, and they've all agreed to stay till like 5 o'clock of the day. So it's not an hour and a half class. They're going to stay with these. With these. Do you think this is pick up some interest in our volunteer part of we hope so, and we will know next week uh, enrollment registration in this week for juniors. We don't know about the fire academy. Uh, those 470 hours we were talking about a while ago, those kids will leave in July with their letters, and they will be ready to go. Uh, Clark's Chapel advertising the county said I think one's got two for squad four positions open. Two or three, four kids interviewed this past month from the first EMT class that we've done 
at the high school this year. So we'll make it down. Uh, one thing you mentioned about the places being available in Macon County for Southwestern and that stuff is you get first shot at hand picking these kids. My son is enrolled in the in a paramedic program in Cherokee right now and they're already recruiting. But so uh, it's out there if you're not in the recruiting business here. Lane County won't lose them. That's a good one. This is, you know, we're talking about what we face here. This is something that I just talked to you all so much for putting this together and coming to us because from the county standpoint, I mean, this is a tremendous effort for us to like support a better feeder program. Uh, the kids are born and raised here, go to school here, uh, want to stay here, and this gives them an opportunity to do that. So, this is things that really matter. Well, and if they're doing an internship with them, so it's the dispatch office. Right. They know if they want to hire them. Okay. That, that time has already been experienced. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That time, you know, they, they've had their training session. They just give us here every day on time. We don't seem really interested in going to be a dedicated employee or being in a full training application. And it saves everybody time. So, that, that's what we're looking for, but hopefully it goes back to generate for the volunteer fire departments also, even if they can't get a career in it because uh, but they're, they're wide open right now. I should go back to hiring some crazy fire departments. It also serves another purpose, too. At Franklin High School last school year, we had a conversation with the early grads. And some of those students had plans to enroll or enlist, but some of those students did not. And they also weren't employed. And so they had nothing that they were doing for the second semester. So this gives them an opportunity to be involved with something and be in the mentorship of a professional where they could um, be inspired to um, move towards something else. And so that's a really, a really great plus for them that they have something that they are looking forward to. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and approach the motion. If we need that motion, I'd like to make a motion at this time to be approved. Pulse, Panther Unified Learning, and Skills Exchange. Does the lady run to the four page trade or something? Before we get too far discussion, let me explain something to me. I understand welding, shopping, bar fighting, and not feeding. But how does cosmetology? come in for a year on economics and it's a career building in public health. Well, one of, this is very new. So when you look, brought you our new course catalog, it's now included in there. Um, but we have been meeting with our seniors and we had about 15 students who said that they like to pursue cosmetology. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Oh, I don't oh, know. Oh, 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 Hair. 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 Hair.
a career on college from a street one right up by the situation to Southwest. Otherwise, so if they decide to do this after they graduate, they'll that's $14,000. They do it now. That much of it's free. They have to pay for gas and things. So a couple of things about the course catalog and then front cover, there's a QR code there. If you scan that, you can be my Facebook friend for CTE, I'm trying to get 500 followers. Um, and then on the back cover too, if you haven't seen our promotional video, scan that, you'll love it. It's one and a half minutes. It's all featuring all of our students out at Angel Medical, out at the airport, and just a Higgins welding class. And it's talking about what they aspire to be. So, make sure to check that out. You're, you're, you're just not on that. I just know y'all. Um, it's on page 25. Page 25. You're asked. Mm -hmm. Fine arts. Go to page 25. If you can read about fine arts and the importance of it for the students, leave the form from me. 25 to 29. If you need to have a conversation with somebody that's important to fine arts. You can see it right here when you see pages. And me looking at this, some of the courses are on the courses. Yes. This, this is real, it's real, really good. But sometimes you get asked about fine arts, what are of those programs where people say music and band or something like that. No, you can open up page 25 to 29 and you can see the value of, of the fine arts program. Okay, and thank you for pointing that out. So this is all electives. Um, so because it's important for kids to be able to have all of these options, <coughs> it's amazing the options that are available. Those kids are really having really impressed with it. Thank you. So now, now you must know that the teachers at the other content area said, well, why aren't our classes in this liquid? So next year when you come, I'll, I'll, I'll hand you like a phone book. So, <laughs> so it's a great thing that they're proud of their, their classes that are available. <laughs> you just pointed out that page that you wanted to put the page before the celebrity here. Oh, that's at the airport. Yes. Oh, and I forgot to tell you all are invited um, next Friday, the 22nd, to the airport. The aviation will be having their second air flight time. So they should be there about 10 a.m. and stay till about 2 if you want to pop in and see what's going on. You'll love it. kicked off at, uh, at the first of the year, and uh, we have certainly been making some progress. Um, Alton West is underway uh, building fiber, and the process they're going through in, uh, in this 
area is they are actually stringing steel strand cables from pole to pole. Uh, and then they will come back and uh, attach the fiber to that steel strand. And so they're about 50% now. Then with the, uh, with the uh, steel cable left, uh, and they've just begun on the fiber, uh, actually down to the general step before they're starting to let you know what that does. One of the uh, they have revised their uh, the card completion to the 1st of June. They were hoping to actually finish uh, uh, by the end of April, 1st of May, but due to some of the weather delays, so, uh, they're pushing that out just a little bit of the hour. Um, one of the reasons they're starting from the General Lesca and then going back up is because uh, they need to install some equipment at the end of April school. And so we met, they actually made a request uh, at the end of last year. Uh, for them to locate a pad and some equipment there at the school. Uh, we all met out there, including uh, Commissioner Dickman, and uh, talked about what they wanted to do. Uh, they then prepared a, uh, a proposal, uh, and that was presented to the Macon County School Board on the 19th of February. Thanks to Mr. Brunauer and Mr. Rowland. Um, we got that uh, agreement. Uh, executed last week, so uh, also much did the uh, work on uh, being ready to construct that pad. Um, of course, the project is to provide connectivity to these five facilities, but um, the uh, and, and of course that's going to provide uh, connectivity for the occupants of those facilities: the fire department, the EMS, uh, the library, of course. Uh, but the other aspect in the community. Uh, due to the lack of connectivity to community in general, is public Wi-Fi. And so what we were able to do is uh, procure a grant for Southwestern Commission. And this uh, is a $50,000 grant that is paying for uh, the equipment and the uh, installation of uh, uh, not only the network equipment that supports the public Wi-Fi, but also the electric hookup and that type of thing. And so uh, we were able to uh, identify the uh, network electrical contractors. We've uh, gotten most of the installation work completed, with the exception of the library. The library is still in progress. And uh, we're hoping to uh, finish coordinating with the uh, uh, Fontana IT department uh, to get uh, the rest of the network stuff installed with the library. And, uh, and once the fiber's in the building, they are investing. Right along. Uh, moving across the mountain, we are uh, we've got a number of other grant programs that are uh, that are in process. Uh, we've got the Frontier Great Grant, and just to uh, remind everybody, that is a 3.8 million dollar grant within the county. It's a 4.3 million dollar project. Um, Frontier has completed their engineering work, their permitting is in progress. They are working on two, what they refer to as wire centers. Um, it's, it's the head end, this is where the fiber terminates to, uh, to, to go out into the community. And so they're working on two different facilities of construction of them uh, within the county. Uh, they uh, got all the materials arriving and staging, and uh, they're working to secure the set contract. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about where that's going to impact the county here in a minute. Uh, Folsom West also has a grant, and they are busy. This is a $1 million grant, just under $1 million. It's a total of $1.2 million project, and that will uh, serve parts of South Macon. And uh, uh, they're currently in the engineering development permitting process. On that and then, of course, we have the charter uh, rural digital opportunity fund subsidy that's just come into our area. That will be a nine million dollar subsidy coming in to, uh, to help build this uh, fiber in the county. But we don't have any updates from charter yet. That's the one we're going to be We hope they're here by mid year. It may be towards the end of the year, but uh, we're hoping they're going to cross the county. So they're uh, currently working on that. Uh, moving on to this map. Uh, of the county. I wanted to kind of illustrate what areas are being impacted by these grants. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, at the map of Macon County here, you see a, a line in red down towards the south end of Macon. Uh, 
uh, that is the area where the county invested in its South Major uh, fiber backbone. Uh, 580000 the county invested in the project uh, to build some infrastructure in South Major County. The, uh, the green uh, line area up in the Nantahala region is the uh, the area that will be impacted by the uh, $350,000 investment that making, making to, uh, to connect the facility up there that will also impact um, the residents along those paths, so that quarter that the fiber passes through. Uh, the areas in blue, the, the bright blue here, this is the area that will be, these are the areas that will be impacted by the bridge bring uh, to Frontier. And, uh, it's kind of spread all around the county. There's parts uh, up in the Burlington area, up, up in the northern part of the county, a little bit up 28, heading from uh, down in uh, just north of Otto and, uh, and, and other areas. And then there's a couple of other areas down in South Maine, one in Otto and, and a couple of blocks in Escape and Mountain in Yellow. Uh, those, are, those will be the areas that are impacted by the great grant and uh, that Boston West is receiving. In that tan area that we keep referring to, and we brought this, this up many times, that those are the areas that will be impacted by this, this uh, uh, charter uh, subsidy that will be coming into the area soon, we hope. Um, but we see there's a lot of other areas that were not um, impacted yet uh, to grant funding. And this is what I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, there's a new program uh, that the state that finally rolling out, we've been talking about it for a while, it's uh, referred to as the CAB grant program, CAB stands for Continuing Access to Broadband. And so the idea behind this program is just to follow on to their great grant program and to try to pick up areas that have not been um, uh, affected by, uh, by the great grant. And we kicked off this program at the first of the year. Um, and one of the things that's different about this program than, uh, than the Great Grant program, Great Grant providers actually decided what they wanted to do. Uh, they put a proposal together and then they, they put those applications in to the state and hopefully they would win based on scoring criteria. Uh, this particular grant program is different in that the county collaborates with the state. Uh, NCDIT is the North Carolina Department of Information Technology. And they uh, administer all the, the broadband grant programs for the state. And so, in this case, Macon County will collaborate directly with, uh, with NCDIT to identify the project areas that we want to, to work on. And uh, once we've done that, uh, that'll be developed into a request for proposals and posted on the state website. And uh, then uh, qualified providers that have been pre-qualified with the state can go and respond and keep doing projects. Those projects in the state. Um, and then once uh, responders uh, send their proposals in, then the county will sit down with the state representatives from the state or review those proposals uh, and uh, select the provider. Uh, this grant program provides a, a maximum of $8 million, and that's the grant itself uh, per county per, per year. Uh, that grant can only be 75% of the total project cost. Uh, if you're 15% provider match as part of the total project cost, then the county is obligated for 10% of the total project cost. Um, in order for us to participate in this process, we've got a couple of things that we've got to do. We've got to go through, we've got to review all areas that are eligible, we've got to select um, priority areas, areas that we want uh, to focus on uh, out of those that are eligible. Then we have to work with, uh, with the state in order to develop this uh, request for proposal. There's a total of about 2,600 locations uh, around the county that are eligible uh, for this grant. And so we would love to get as many of us as we can. Can we show a picture here in just a minute? I hope we can go ahead and get back. We're going to bring dogs. And this is that same map I showed you before, but all of the, uh, the green dots scattered throughout uh, these other areas are, are ones that have not been affected by another grant. So those are all uh, dots or locations that are eligible to receive funding as part of the program. We want to hit as many of those as we can. 
uh, we're hoping uh, to hit a project of around 1,000 to 1,200 locations. Uh, a maximum grant for our county would be uh, $10,670,000. Uh, and it could serve, uh, based on some of our estimates, could serve about 2,100 locations. So there's no way we could hit all of them uh, in a single calendar. So, um, so we're kind of projecting that that the project would be of a medium size. It would be uh, potentially up to uh, six million based on that uh, hundred twelve hundred locations we think we might be able to hit. And that's based on some work that we've looked at. Uh, we're making an estimate at the moment of about five thousand dollars per passive per home per, per location. And that's based on what we saw out of the great brain uh, So that yields project of about six million for the twelve hundred location. Uh, the actual project could be a little smaller, could be a little bigger, depending on what the state um, uh, requires us to do, and also the fund. In order for us to enter into this program, um, the county must provide a formal match. Okay? We have to basically uh, tell the state that we are willing to commit uh, X amount of funds uh, to go after this program. Uh, and of course, uh, we can't really participate with the state until we make that commitment. We only really want to work with counties that are, that are able to make that commitment. Uh, so what we're asking for tonight, we're asking for the board to uh, approve a match commitment. Uh, the match commitment we would like to see, and we would like to see a match commitment that would allow us to take advantage of the full eight million dollar grant. And that match commitment would be uh, one million six hundred seven. Uh, that would be a 10% of a, of a full match, or of a full grade, if we were to receive that. Um, you know, the management commitment can be less. For example, an 800 day commitment uh, could support an $8 million project. So, you know, we, we could be less than that. We don't anticipate it's going to be a full project, but, but we would like to have the opportunity to go after it. And then, of course, the funds are only utilized if the grant's awarded, if we're able to select a provider. We have a provider that actually uh, uh, bids on the project and uh, wants the final So that's kind of what we're looking for here. And, uh, we would like to participate in the grant program if we have the opportunity to bring up the $10 million into the, or at least an $8 million grant to the percent match, of course, for that. We need to basically uh, create a letter of commitment there to form that the state has that, uh, and once the board uh, agrees that we're willing to uh, make that commitment, we'll, uh, we'll complete that form and, and send that to the state so we can begin working with them. Um, so also included in your agenda packet following Mr. Lee's presentation when we talked about funding um, of that, you know, we, would, we have recommended here $396,425 to get together a, a grant project for this amendment to the American Rescue Plan Act that we received. We'll have, uh, we're projecting $396,425 and that's left over after the part of funds have been used for the premium uh, pipe. And so utilizing that would bring the general fund amount uh, needed for this commitment down by $396,425. Those ones draw your attention to that. And to do that, you basically use that $396,425 uh, for revenue replacement. And same way we did with the uh, premium pay, and then it would go towards that one million, uh, one million sixty-seven thousand dollars. Uh, it would go towards that. So the balance of that would be what would be required for the six hundred seventy thousand five hundred seventy-five dollars. Would be required for the general fund. That would allow for the uh, eight million. Uh, Full $8 million project. That $8 million project. 
the whole project really end up could be up to a million. state is pushing for is the state would like to see as many projects actually go to agreement before the end of this fiscal year, uh, if possible. Uh, they already have 30 counties um, that have signed their commitment um, out, of, out of one of their counties. Okay. And then we could spend our, there's 396.25 of our money bodies in the 31st, 20.6 and and the way this particular program works is uh, once the project goes to agreement which means uh, it's been approved by the county it's been approved by the state and all parties have signed an agreement uh, then the county would uh, uh, give the funds directly to the state immediately in full, instead of a 50 50 like we did in the other grant program and then the state would manage all uh, as far as the county is concerned. Uh, right. uh, what you have to realize here when you look at this map, you can see that we're doing a lot of stuff with the state grants. And now all this, I'm going to call it yellow, and call it that door there, it's on this map. Carter, he went fed with this thing. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're not allowed to touch those areas because it's a federal grant program. Uh, there is uh, language in the uh, treasury rules and also in, in, in subsequent federal programs that say uh, funds can't be used in two places, uh, in one place from two different funds. So because there's funding from this, uh, federal program for these can areas we can use them the state for any funding for the exact state legislation So because of that constraint, we're trying to focus on what we can address at this point in time. And all of these uh, these green dots here, the big the cluster in Sanders County, Addington Mill, Pillage area, North of Highland, South of Highlands, um, and Corrado. So um, uh, our job is to is to prioritize these areas and to try to impact the community. So that's that's been our thing. And the yellow area there, it makes all the road and we're nervous about that. It does because there's no guarantee that they will finish that project. We're we're certain that they will come into the county. We don't know how much they'll actually go down. They have ways to wiggle out of getting some of those things done. They're certainly committed to this time to do it, but uh, I'll do it. I am more of a reserve. If they back out, what will happen? What will we do if they back out? Certainly, you know, there's... This is a big uh, conundrum right now uh, across all the state programs because uh, because the federal programs have a very long um, uh, cycle, uh, they don't have to have that built out until 2028. And all of these grant programs at the state level uh, are much shorter term uh, programs. And a lot of the funds that they're using in state programs will be exhausted by 2028. And so if Charger decides to come in and just build out in a few places and then they walk away, and we're already able to get out of it, then we're left with areas that are very remote that are very difficult for us to do. So it's a problem, and uh, everyone nationwide is aware of this of this issue, and there's a lot of things that are in the works at the moment to try to address some of these things. That's why it's so important that we 
get this commission down so we can act on that. Absolutely. If they're delayed, it, there will be subsequent money in the coming years that, are, that will actually be funded through the state, through the uh, infrastructure investment and jobs bill. Um, that money won't start coming into this program until probably the 2025. So we want to be able to take advantage of the funds that are available today so that if we have new problems to tackle tomorrow, we can do that. Anything else, Mr. Moody? Anything else? This really should be a, probably a two-part motion. Is are we committed to proceeding as a board to a broadband and make it carry? So we've done two projects. Scaly Auto and the Mayor Haley has worked out here. We've had nearly a million dollars in the fair taxpayer money. We've been committing another million, six to seven thousand to go after a million in grants to what you should get. So I'll make a Motion that we uh, commit to uh, showing uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Second. I'll second. Mr. Hayden, does your motion include, include the grant project ordinance and then the general fund appropriation as well? Yeah, we can pay it. So just for the record, let's be sure. So we need, you need the letter of commitment. Correct. So the letter of commitment will commit Macon County to $1,067,000 a match. Correct? Correct. The second part of that would be to approve the ARC grant project ordinance amendment that was within your agenda packet. And the third part would be appropriate $670,575 from general fund balance as part of this grant what I just said, okay, is your, your substitute you motion? <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure we cover all pieces. And I second the motion. Any further discussion? I feel like I need to bring up a few issues that really kind of jump out at me. It's not the personal view or even motion. I know you put a lot of time in this. I don't think this is the wrong way, but I'm going to bring you a curveball. I'm under the impression this is really going to provide internet and cell coverage to parts of the community that really don't have it. Look at this map. But that's more or less where we already have it. You know, we drive the Scaly Mountain Highlands. I mean, you probably don't have internet service at your house or cell phone service. Uh, not hard on service. And Halo, but you know, they Boston called me whenever we provided the 441 access. I don't have the numbers in front of me. I don't want to misquote them, but I remember it's not a number of around $300 and something dollars a month for my business. Okay. Yeah, to have done. And I'm sitting here thinking that we're paying taxpayer dollars, grant funds, for one company to be able to run on and collect these fees every month. I have a little bit of heartburn, but I feel like the intent for me is to be able to <coughs> bring self coverage to Nana Halo and bring self coverage to Middle Creek and also in Tesla and Staley. Look at this map, and I thought these green dots are all in those concentrated areas that, for the most part, already have that service. And I don't, you know, I thought maybe I don't have a clear understanding, but right now, for me, another million dollars on the budget, I'm having a little bit of anxiety. I would probably support this after this budget session and, and the parks and rec stuff, the schools that are coming up. But for me to pay $300 a month, I went and got started. That's what we have. That's cheap, easy. I have everything I need. And I'm, I'm pretty simple. I mean, you can probably put that together, but. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to address a couple of things. So, uh, one of the things that the county has done is the county didn't pay for the project. For example, in South Nation, they brought the fiber by your business. What the county did is they paid for a little piece of the project. The project probably cost on the order of about a million, maybe two, to run that fiber all the way from the south end of um, uh, the city limits of Franklin uh, down to Otto connect up through um, the Tessensee Valley all the way up to Scaly and it also goes up to Sydney. <coughs> that was a big project to affect a large area, okay, number one. And a lot of that investment came from Boston West. Uh, a lot there was also investment from Haley and C on that project. And so it was a collaboration and the county did did pay for it. Absolutely. Um, 
So this was service that didn't exist before, and so it also cost money to provide that service. So what you were being asked for, what you were being asked for, service fees uh, uh, for to, to connect to and any provider who gets grant money, that would include Frontier, Charter when they come in. Um, there's other providers in the county as well. Uh, they all have to make a business case, and they all have to make uh, they have to make the subscriber. Uh, fees, monthly fees, pay for the maintenance of the facility. So we're helping to defray some of the infrastructure costs through these grants. We're helping to get that fiber put in. We're helping to get um, you know, some of these other things done. Uh, the fiber going to a cell tower is in, in that valley that owns the tower. Um, and Balsam's putting that in. But um, they have to keep the business going. So they have to pay for all the equipment that, that light up that fiber. They have to, uh, they have to, you know, at the end of the day, all businesses have to make profit. So, uh, so all the companies, Frontier included, Charter, they're all in it for profit. And in these rural areas where it's so expensive per location to serve, um, the grant money, the, uh, the Kickstarter, uh, uh, exercises that we've done at the county level. Uh, there was, it was a grant in South Macon, a procurement in Bahia, that helps to defer some of the costs. It, it doesn't pay for it all, but it helps. And it helps. Otherwise, there's no business case for these companies. You know, as far as the areas that don't need it, even though you see there's areas with a lot of coverage in the middle and around Franklin, it doesn't mean that everybody can serve or, or can be served. And so the way these locations are determined is these locations that are reported with no service, they're not being served by any company at all. They may get self-service, uh, but they may not have hardline service. This particular grant has for the great grant of for hardline uh, uh, or, or fixed wireless type uh, direct internet service, not self-service. Uh, none of these grant programs are for self uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but it may not. I guess it remains as long as maybe it's going to go across the board and you don't have a fundamental. And I'd be happy to talk to you more about it at one point in time. I think there's a lot of open space here, too, during the process of providing service. It's the lack of density in our rural area, a density of a customer. And so, just for example, within a 12-mile stretch of road, uh, or a one-mile stretch of road, to build a mile of fiber or whatever, whether it's, they, nobody builds cable in the for a mile of fiber, a company has to have at least 12 customers along that mile. Uh, to, to pay. Uh, I mean, I ran by her. I mean, I ran by her. I mean, I
uh, that this board issued a, a request for qualifications for the construction manager at risk services for the Franklin High School project. We issued that in February. We received uh, responses to that from three uh, construction manager at risk contracting firms on March 6th of 2024. The selection committee uh, that was established for that project consisted of the liaison committee, uh, so that would be Chairman Shields, Vice Chairman Young, as well as school board members. Uh, we have Ms. Breedwoods here tonight, as well as Chairman Jim Breelove, who was on the uh, selection committee. Uh, the first order of business, once the request for qualifications were received, we received three responses. One from Benoit Construction, one from Carroll Daniel Construction, and one from Batson Cook Construction. The first order of business was this, for the selection committee using a set of predetermined criteria that was developed from our RFQ. Uh, this contained things such as general company information, uh, things like licensing information for the company, their corporate history, their organizational structure. Um, uh, their years of service, uh, any current projects they had going, any litigation they had ongoing. Each of those under the general company information uh, heading were assigned a value that combined with project experience. So each one of these firms in their response to the request for qualifications included a history of similar project experience uh, that they have had with projects similar to the Franklin High School project, both in size and, and in in the kind of building we're building, which is a new school. So we were able, the committee was able to evaluate three of those projects. Um, they evaluated them both for similarity and uh, in terms of what was the original budget cost for the project and what did that project come in at. Uh, so how, what was the difference there? Were the firms uh, coming in uh, under cost? Were they coming in above cost? Were they coming in right where they needed to be? Uh, same thing for timeline. You know, we've talked about not only is cost important here, timeline's important as well on this project. We know we're in the crunch, uh, you know, on an active campus. We know we've got to get things done. So the timeline, how, how long did each of these companies say they were going to take to complete these projects versus how long it actually took them to complete them. So uh, the, the committee evaluated and assigned the point value for these important metrics related to project experience. Also, and most importantly, uh, the, the key personnel, who's going to be uh, who's going to be working on this project. Each company, as part of this qualification packet, had to provide a sworn statement identifying the key personnel that was going to serve on this project. The uh, committee evaluated this based on uh, the roles that each of these individuals would be serving, the, uh, each of their resumes, uh, which included, you know, how, how long have they been doing it, what kind of projects have they worked on. And, and lastly, uh, each firm gave us a little bit of an insight on how they would handle the proposed Franklin High School project based on the information that was available uh, for the request, uh, made available in the request for qualification. So once each of these companies were assigned a point value of each of these three companies, uh, there was a high scorer and a low scorer. Um, Carol Daniel uh, was the high scorer in this process of, of, of ranking uh, these firms. But the next order of business uh, the, uh, the selection committee wanted to interview each of these firms that had submitted a request for qualifications. So uh, these firms were interviewed on March 11th by the selection committee. Uh, this was a, a great exercise where each of the firms came. They, they gave a detailed presentation and allowed members of the selection committee to ask them detailed questions about uh, this project, about their timeline for this project, how they uh, felt this project, uh, things we could do to make this project better, and just to get that impression uh, that, that you want to interview, the impression you want to get why you conduct interviews to begin with. Um, we want to have a face-to-face -face meeting with each of these, again, because this is such an important project, and I think I'm going to speak for the selection committee, but of course they wanted their uh, recommendation to be uh, the best of those firms for this project. And so, once the interview process concluded, uh, Carol Daniel, again, uh, stood out in the interview process and, and, and gave that selection committee a real level of comfort uh, based on their project experience, based on their project history, and for those experienced individuals in their firm, that they would be the ones uh, to handle this project. And that is who the uh, 
liaison committee will be recommended here tonight. The next steps, uh, once we have, uh, we will now begin contract negotiations with this construction manager at risk, Carol Daniel, and we will uh, then be bringing before this board to approve uh, on March 25th a contract for pre-construction services. Um, going back to the construction manager at risk process, how that process works. Um, it is a new process to us, but we have learned a lot about it. Uh, we have been consulting with our architect as well as uh, consultants and each of the firms that, that actually came through and interviewed. We have found that the construction manager at risk process is uh, the only way to go on a project of this magnitude, on a project of this complexity. So that's why we chose that method. So the first part of that contract, uh, the construction manager will come in uh, and, and they will get with the architect. They will go through the architect's plans. They will help the architect develop and finish those plans. And in doing that, they will be able to go through and analyze where we can seek budget savings, um, where we can, uh, you know, cost avoidance, how we can get this project uh, into the budget and into the timeline um, that, that this board expects, I think that the school board expects, and, and, and the citizens of Maple County expect. So that will be the first part of this contract will be to bring that pre-construction contract in here on March 25th and approve that. Once that's approved, they will go through the pre-construction exercise with the architect and the final product of that will be a guaranteed maximum price. That is another thing that is, uh, that is very attractive about this construction manager at risk process. Through that uh, guaranteed maximum price, they're basically saying going in, this is what this is gonna cost anything above that amount on us. So it will not exceed that amount. We will not have the, the incidents such as uh, we saw here tonight with the locker room project where we had change orders uh, that we were having to approve over and above contingency. So this is designed to be a smooth process because it is so complex. The general contractor being involved on the front end offers us tremendous benefits on the back end and where that guaranteed maximum price comes into play. And, and that, would, that is what will be used uh, to do, on, in the construction phase, we will, that guaranteed maximum price, the fee we will, will negotiate at that time, will be a percentage of the overall cost. But again, as we have done with this whole project, with the architects, with the construct, we're taking it one piece at a time. So in order to get to the next piece, this is the definite next step that we have to take to the Franklin High School project, will be to enter into a pre-construction uh, agreement with uh, Carol Daniel Construction, and we will be asking uh, the board to approve that recommendation here tonight and allow us to bring uh, the contract that we have negotiated for pre-construction services uh, for construction manager at risk for the Franklin High School project with Carol Daniel Construction at the March 25th meeting. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll back over to you. I just want to take during discussion to answer any questions and kind of give a brief summary. The manager did a good job summarizing what Mr. Green and Mr. Green and Mr. Chilton and I got to sit through. We sat through about four and a half hours of interview. And uh, in my opinion, what stuck out with Carol Daniel is the volume, you know, just the amount of volume that they do in school projects. They're pretty much the biggest builder in the southeast. They pretty much built predominantly most of the schools in the state of Georgia. At any given time, they have 12 to 15 schools. I would venture to say in particular in the K-12 schools going at any point in time. Most of, most of uh, again, northeast Georgia have been built by the building. Currently, are about to start the new Raker County High School. They currently, they currently are working at Raker Gap Coochie School. And so to me, you think about buying power a few months behind Raker Gap, you're buying two schools, almost a million square feet at the same time. And so I think at the end of that, it's going to ultimately save us. Plus, Georgia has figured out how to build a school. I mean, it's not a secret. When you drive around down there, they've got these schools down pat. And uh, for me, bringing a builder like that, I'm not saying or suggesting that anybody we interviewed couldn't do that. 
but their resume spoke for itself, and that's why I had confidence in uh, making that motion.
fuel offers tax value for a piece of property with surplus, and need surplus, we will entertain that offer and end up set debt process. So based on that, I, based on our previous discussion, I'll make a motion to entertain uh, to accept the offer for uh, uh, to go through the upset debt process. And just for clarification, there is no requirement that an upset bid be on this five percent. I mean, somebody may come in and say, well, I want to cut to the chase, I don't want this to drag on, I don't want the property to sit up there. Um, you know, um, to the elements without being cared for, um, they may come in and bid up $200,000. Know, if somebody really wants it, they can come in and make that bid and see if anybody wants that set that. So it doesn't have to go in five percent either. It can go in whatever. I mean, if anybody, this just if anybody listening has an interest in that property, then they're welcome to upset it for a million dollars. Again, totally up to the board. If the board has better plans or ideas for that, then certainly now would be a good time off of the end of it. If I'm reading this agreement correctly, you have to raise the bid by a minimum of 10% for the first $1,000, 5% for the statute, correct? Yeah, so it's a funny math problem, but it's nice to pay for it. His motion was to approve the offer in the amount of $2,900. To start the upset bid. Will they have to assess the value of the house? What's the breakdown now? Yeah. Please start off. Building value is assessed at 36,000 PPM. Land value is assessed at 66,700. A property like that is used by the uh, community. There's also a, a, a precinct. I feel that um, we haven't had any public input on releasing the community property like that. Uh, I think uh, I think we should have the public here on releasing that property before we just give it away. To, or not give away, but sell a uh, property that maybe the community is attached to that, except by no means uh, sell it. So I think, I think moving forward, which you made a motion. Uh, mm -hmm. so, We acquired the property. It had been turned over to the Macon County Historical Preservation Society, and that was done um, before my time to out and find that this place. That then just kind of dissolved, and so it had been sitting out there owned by this entity that was basically dissolved. And so contacted members of the room, class members of that society, and they kind of had a they voted in a meeting um, to one that the corporation and agreed to convey it back to the county. There was a reversion clause in that deed, um, and so that's how that deed got signed and given back. Mr. Hickman, we are performing maintenance on it, and then it's lost in the county, so So, uh, I would. Uh, so we're going to die unless somebody's going to try to revive it in a second. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank well, so that one, I guess we first have to announce that the motion that 
the provision motion died for lack of a second, and then that died, and then, then we have the new motion. Where do you call it now? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. We uh, have a public hearing on uh, the kinds of school property uh, to get the public input before we go into the contract. No, and with, that's where we're going. I would just, for purposes of efficiency, I'd say let's schedule that public hearing before the next county meeting in April so that we don't have to call feedback or we don't have to pay me to attend the second meeting. And then, then just for clarification, the plan would be, since I would be in charge of noting that, I do have email um, from the neighbors that we get changed quickly, and I would most certainly let them know obviously because I'd be trying to get somebody to keep up in that bid. But we're not going to that was before. We can still do that even after we have a public hearing on that. So we can certainly notice this for have a full public hearing before the April meeting about this issue. Well could we include that in the uh the contingent of this meeting? Are you saying at the April meeting though? I'm just saying that notice it for the April meeting. Yeah, notice it for the April meeting, not not, not the 25th. Okay. Right. Not the 25th. The 25th has already been noted as for yeah. a building. Okay. In the newspaper tomorrow, the okay. one you approved this morning actually got sent to the paper on Friday in order to make that happen um, in time. That one required a 10 day notice. Um, we go ahead and announce today an open meeting that that is going to be a public hearing today when we're covered. Any further discussion? All in favor? Five Not agreeing? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Four more. Okay. 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 Yes. Yep. So we've got the sales tax referendum, and I believe that is in the packet. This is um, similar, or if not identical, to the referendum we had a year and a half ago. Um, so this would be a resolution calling for a special advisory referendum for the levy of a one-quarter cent county sales and use tax. Um, that would be voted upon at the November election if the board so approved. We would submit that to the Board of Elections for inclusion on that ballot. We've got to have a so for, for, for Ms. Skeezer, we got to have a verbal second.
you don't have much here in Macon County. I know some cities have consistently gone to surrounding counties and the people that everybody else is says. It doesn't make sense for us to not have people that have to come to the people and have to prioritize the problem.
if anybody wants to be a part of that, I can sure Derek and Lori or we'll, we'll let, let you know what that is. I don't have one anymore. Well, uh, I don't have any trouble. I'll make a motion that we uh, solicit an audit view for the engineering services to permit Mason County Landfill Phase 3, cell 2, and closure of Mason County Landfill Phases 1 and 2. I've heard the motion. Two seconds. Second. Second. Mr. Brandon Barnes. Any further discussion? All those votes. I'll let you know we'll get you on that. Um, if you want to, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if you were committing or just really curious. I want to volunteer, John. I'll help you. I don't we'll want to be happy to have any of you. If you want to help anybody, right? Yeah. Because my father, I don't mean, I'm the finance person. I'll just. So, yeah. We're welcome to any other Well, like I said, if, if you remember, and they're kind of what you said was written down up here. But all the things he was saying about their criteria, pretty much very exactly the same criteria. criteria. Yeah, yeah. Experience, similar, experience, similar yeah. projects. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I hope Tammy took good enough. We're going back to H now. Uh, so, what H is, um, is the um, approval of a, resident, of a resolution exempting uh, engineering services in the amount of $150,000 from the uh, RFQ process. Um, and basically, this is, this is kind of a kickoff piece to what will become these projects. Um, the development of a landfill, uh, briefly, you know, you set your boundaries by what setbacks you have to have from neighbors, waterways, state parks, whatever. Uh, but then you also have to set it horizontally, how deep you can go, and then how high is kind of set by the outer boundary. But we have to we have to know how deep we can go. So in order to uh, hit the ground running with this project, at, after we get through that process. Um, and I'll, again, I'll return briefly to why I say get, get the ground running. This, the hydro work has to happen in front of that process because that is what the bottom contour of the landfill that this process, uh, they have to know what the bottom's going to look like to build it into the construction documents and the permitting documents. Um, so, this is for services to perform at the hydro, uh, it's a DHR and uh, hydrologic, hydrologic investigation uh, report, which I should, that will be used by the, the engineers to develop the bottom of the new land. Are you going to <laughs> Even the meat and potatoes, I mean, why do we need to present for an RFP? Just, okay, so I, I said I wouldn't, I did. Circling back to the timeline, uh, the faster we can start this process, the better we want to be on the back end. We have a tight schedule to build. Uh, as you know, we're, we're running out of space until phase three, cell one. Uh, our vertical expansion has been going on. is in the hands of the state. We're waiting for approval. Uh, but that still puts us at about three years, uh, plus or minus. Um, and so the, the timeline for this project uh, is, is two plus years. Uh, and that's counting on the state being responsive and getting our getting our approval back to us at a time. Uh, so it's a tight window, and the only way we can get started and hit the ground running in July with what will be the meat of getting the 
permit is to have this information collected and ready for the engineers like on July 1st. Does that make sense? That's no, this is the DOE, the Neil Lamons is is the higher. So yeah, so if y'all are are cool and we'll whatever the Lord says. Yeah.
well, the program, the application process that a company would go through to become registered in the county. Um, I have not, uh, I have not delved into, well, operationally, administratively, I don't think it's a heavy risk, so I'm not concerned about that. But any punitive pieces of this, uh, I just haven't gone there because I wanted feedback from you gentlemen uh, before I brought you something that you didn't want to see. What's, what's the real issue here? They, they tell me you don't crash, they pay the bill. That's not, no, the, the, the issue is honestly about protecting the system. I mean, that's why people regulate traffic. John, six months ago, you had a construction crew that came down the road and dumped it on the side of the road. Well, if we have if we have people registered and that is a registered hauler, um, that makes us easier. It makes it easier easier for us to track them down. It also makes it easier for us to hold them accountable. Because right now we have no mechanism to hold them accountable. But depending on the punitive piece that gets built into this, and I've, I've asked Eric to, to look at you know what statutory authority we have in how this can be um, But that's one piece of it. Another piece is just making sure these people have are licensed to do business in North Carolina, have insurance. If somebody comes and drops a can and crushes your car or tears down your fence, if it's Johnny Johnny trailer, you know, and that, and that person doesn't have any insurance, that's going to impact us. I don't want to stop anybody from hauling trash uh, in the manner that, that I've discussed. Just a matter of having a county of those people uh, so that the citizens, I mean, you don't, you don't have to hire somebody, I mean, you don't necessarily have to hire somebody that, that has been registered, although the whole project kind of pointless unless, unless you do hire somebody. But that means we bet them they at least have insurance. If they've got both employees, they have workman's comp, they have they are licensed to do business in North Carolina. Uh, and we've got them on our radar. I'm inspect, I'm inspecting their equipment. If they've got if they're just pulling a trailer, does it have a functioning car? Does it have holes in the side? You know, just I mean just just basic stuff so that we're not getting windblown litter from people pulling uncarved trailers. Uh, we're not getting people illegally dumping and not, not having an avenue to uh, to enforce anything punitive against those people. Uh, that's I mean that and basically I'm trying to fulfill what the ordinance says uh, that, that makes the county with this. Um, the ordinance um, I think I. I think I listed some pertinent sections, uh, so if you want to check and see where I'm coming from. But like I said, all I want to do right now is is, is just get this out there to uh, and to a ledger. Feel free to reach back out to me with comments, concerns, uh, and that's that's where it'll be. It's still. Do other counties have ordinances? Yes, most counties, most most counties do want their do want licensed haulers. They do track their haulers. Uh, and again, it's just for it's just for all the things that it's to kind of give you some control over all the things that can go bad. I mean, you know, if, if, if I go and pick up your trash and I charge you uh, what would I charge? hundred bucks per second a can and $150 for tending tipping fee, and I go and dump it in a holler somewhere, I got 250 bucks, and the county's got a mess. So it's, it's, it's really just a matter of keeping track and holding people accountable. If somebody brings something in to me that uh, is a banned material or a hazard material, I need to be able to hold that, I need to be able to hold that hauler live. So, I need an accounting. I need a, re a record of who is bringing me stuff. And like I said, even as simple as, do you have a car? When you come in here, is your load car? Or have you been littering all the way from wherever you came? Uh, so it's, it's just a mechanism to do a lot of the things that 
we already kind of do, but put an actual procedure to them uh, as anticipated in the ordinance. Is this only for the fans? Is this only for fans? Yes. So it does not apply to dump trucks and dump trailers? No, 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 I'm sorry. Anything that can haul, like, there's, there's some parts in here where I talk about it should be. Um, whether this is just for people for hire or if it's for people who are bringing their own. Uh, if you bring a chip truck in, it's your stuff on your truck, do you have to have a license? There's a lot of them that don't. So I have license or insurance around there every day. And there's a lot of drivers. Well, like I said, that's. I feel like that's why we have the DOT and DMV. Well, I've said that a million not, not times. Mean. No, I've said that a million times the same thing with regard to littering because that's their, that's them and not us. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing an inspection on this. All I want to know is, can you cover it? Does it have holes? Uh, and and are you, are you on my list? That's that's really all I care about. Because if you're on my list and you have insurance, you have a business license. Uh, you are, you know, you are good to do business in Macon County. But that's protection to the customers and a role of knowing that these people, for, for, for lack of anything else, that these people are all on level playing uh, But yes, one of the, one of the things that, that I am still on the fence about and, and I'm looking for feedback is if you're hauling your own, some, in some ways, I think, well, maybe not, but in some ways, I think, yeah, we should probably pick them up, too, if they're showing up every time. Or if they're, if they're showing up with their own stuff. Uh, but it gets into what 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 problems are we trying to fix, or what what problems are we trying to save off and not. You say, all of a sudden, now you have these guys out of driver's licenses, they're scared to go to landfills, and now they are dumping stuff over the bank because they're scared to Well, no, I'm not, I'm not checking. I, I'm only checking their quick. I mean, it's okay. I'm here to see this guy. But you're checking the hot load, so we're feeling about Yeah, I mean, we're doing that anyway. Yeah. It's just now, it gives me a mechanism to, instead of saying, you know, take this back or call these people to come get this, this is what should happen with this material but it can't come here and they just go and put it in a bigger bag and tie it off better and hide it better but it gives me an actual mechanism to, to potentially have a, have a punitive cost that I can apply to that company um, to pay for proper disposal when that shows back up and I call a hazardous waste company to come uh, well, I mean, even with this paperwork that you've seen out, Chris, uh, you have collection vehicle information, waste haul registration application, which is asking for tax ID number, uh, number of fleet, and you're saying um, here that you want to know all the insurance information from these vehicles. Uh, I mean, it, it just. I just want to know that you have liability insurance. I don't know. Well, I, I mean, if that was the case, we could solve the problem at the border. If we were magical and we could do that, I mean, we can't do it. I'm, and I'm going to tell you something else. I followed a truck, the county's hauler from Highlands all the way to Franklin. I videoed this. 38 pieces of trash blew out of that trailer. So. We got an issue just because you cover this trailer or this truck does not mean that trash is not going to blow out of there. And and so, to me, this is absolutely nothing more than government overreach. Um, that that's that simple. Um, your job is to take trash in and dispose of that trash in the landfill. In my mind, you're not out here to inspect. Um, people's vehicles and whether they got driver's license and insurance and everything else because I look at the sheriff's department uh, stuff and I see all these people that have been arrested for no driver's license. Well, that you cannot 
do apples to apples here, and as, as uh, uh, Commissioner Young always says, we can't. We got to call a spade a spade, and and so to me, if you're going, only the people that law abiding abide by this stuff, and so to me, you're, uh, this is penalizing uh, some new companies that have come in here that is calling stuff. And we need a private, uh, strong private sector. Uh, and so, therefore, this is, to, to my mind, is nothing more than government overreach. Well, with all due respect, my job is to enforce the ordinance of Major County, and that is an ordinance that says we will have this. It's, it's not going to break my heart if we don't. But the ordinance says we do, and I think there are some protections that are due to our citizens and some potential problems that this would solve. I don't care I don't care if you have a driver's license. I go and see that you don't have holes and you have a tarp and you have a tax ID so you're legal to do business in North Carolina, I'm gonna put a sticker on you. And that's the end of it. Until the next year. And all I'm looking for then, do you still have a tarp? Is there still a lot of holes? Okay, so the ones that don't have a tax ID and um, and everything else, where they're going where are they gonna put the tarp? If you if you restrict them to the point that they cannot come in and do business in the landfill, I'm not saying they can't do business. Again, I know you haven't had time to read it, but one of the things we also have an ordinance that says if waste is generated in Macon County, it is to come from Macon County landfill. So I'm not when I talk about punitive, I'm not talking about denying anybody access to the landfill. What I'm talking about is a citizen that needs this service can make the decision, do I want somebody that the county has vetted and said is, is has at least promised to the county that they're going to do it the right way, or not? And if not, I, I, you can still use them. If they tear your mess up, it's, it's just going to be a lawsuit because they might not have any interest. But I don't, I don't care if they do it. I'm just telling you, we say we're going to, we're going to provide some protection to the citizens. We don't say we're going to keep anybody from doing this. Have any of, has any citizens of Macon County uh, contacted you and said you they were concerned about who was hauling their garbage off their property? Once again, John, I'm going. I'm bringing you something the ordinance says we will do. Well, and that's that's good. That's it. To review the ordinance and, uh, and make adjustments to the ordinance or whatever the case may be. That's right. Uh, uh, I mean, we're still having issues with illegal dump sites and everything else already. I can't imagine um, what was happening. So, who would use the word "crime" or who would use the word "crime"? I don't know who else would. Crime board, 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 so I guess I guess what I see here is maybe you're presenting a business model that say you're going to be higher. You know, you won't have it. But I think the area that Mr. Sherrill is going is people that don't take the ground. You know, people that uh, people right now there's contact with a lot of license performing construction. Maybe you can knock up that authority. Well, and they and they have both of you are They yeah. have an unfair advantage. I'm going to lay back on to the other. Like I said, I'm not saying company A that did does and company B that don't. I don't care that they both exist, but the citizen has a right to know. Uh, I do think what you're making. I think you both have all the points. Anyway, like I said, it's, it's, it's in your court. If you never want to hear about it again, just don't come back to any comment. It's loud as up. What are you referring to? You guys are welcome to the board. It's not uh, that's good, that's good discussion. What the planning board is, you just have a broad array of community members at large that men and women of all ages and all walks of life and they take this on and get to it. I would recommend it. I haven't, I haven't got a piece of that I'm sorry, I'm bogged down right now. So I'm behind it. Let me, I mean, let me, I haven't reviewed any of this yet. So then, if it's sent to me, I'm going to get it. I'm 
Um, so let me get with Chris, look at, the text, or look at our ordinance, then look at this, and then, um, then I'll come back to you and say, present it, and let you all decide that one. How about that? Yeah. But the um, one that's the one that we need to let them know.
minutes later. I did late. Okay. Okay. Well, I was still here. You come, yeah. still you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's the game. Well, well, I was here for the same. Yeah. Yeah, we got to keep these two in mind. They're 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 trouble. Thank you for being here. They might have had some questions for you. Oh, you're going to sit right there. Motion to adjourn. Uh, we have to we clarify. What we got to clarify what we went into the position. Yeah. I mean, in the closed session. Oh. Who's going to do that? Uh, okay. Sure. So, we ran into closed session for purposes of property acquisition yeah. under 143. Mm -hmm. um, they have no 318.11a. Property acquisition. Yep. Yeah. I make a motion we adjourn. Second, Josh. All right. All in favor? Thank you.